Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm Andres Ramirez. This episode has been re-recorded with better equipment and software on the occasion of the first anniversary of this podcast. Because this is the episode that introduces most people to the podcast, I wanted it to become a better experience. If you want to hear the Legacy Episode 1, that's still available on the Patreon. In this episode, we're going to meet the beautiful and ruthless Queen Sopialat. She has long been credited for the massacre of a hundred of the king's relatives to ensure her claim to the throne, but she would not hold on to power for long. This is the story of the last queen of Burma. Miss Leon, right this way. Very nice to meet you, babe. These are all brand new from Antwerp. You're the first person I've shown them to. What are those? Those? Those are very special. Burmese pearl drop earrings, set with emeralds and rare pigeon blood red rubies. They were worn by Queen Subiella at her self-anointed coronation in 1878. How much? Having you wear one of my pieces is better publicity than I can buy. Did you catch that? You've seen the 2018 movie Crazy Rich Asians, but that reference to Queen Sopiala probably flew past you the first time. Heiress Astrid Leong, played by the stunning Gemma Chan, purchased the earrings worn by Queen Sopiala at her self-anointed coronation in 1878. That's an interesting shout-out to a somewhat forgotten figure from Myanmar's long and tumultuous history. And there's a reason she's largely absent from pop culture. We'll get to that by the end of this episode. To untangle this dramatic, perhaps overly dramatic, story, we'll begin in 1859. So Pialat was born in 1859 to King Mindon Min and the Queen of Alanandao, also known as Sin Machin. Remember that name, she's really important. We don't know much about Supialat's early years. A surviving account by John Appenezer Marx published in 1917 reads, As a child, I had known Sopialat to be cruel and vindictive. Her mother knew of her weakness, and instead of correcting it, she condoned it. Talking to me one day about her, she said, Yes, she is a bad boy. She has always been a bad boy. Using the masculine gender as a term of endearment. As far as I was able to judge, it seemed to me that the mother's idea was that by encouraging her in her badness, her daughter would acquire authority. Supialat was the second of three daughters. She and her sisters, Supiagi and Supialai, grew up in relative comfort, their mother an increasingly important figure in court politics. In the grainy photographs available to us today, Supialat is striking. Picture her, sitting with her legs to one side, her hands poised in her lap, her eyes piercing through the camera. There is an almost unexpected sharpness about her a quality highlighted by the delicate silks and glittering jewels she favored. Now zoom out of that photograph in your mind, and you'll find another important figure sitting next to her, a prince called Thibault. Thibault was Supiala's half-brother. He was King Mindon's son with one of his consorts, Longshemi Baya, who had long been banished from the palace court. Traditionally, Burmese kings had three queens and many consorts. In fact, King Mindon had more than a hundred concubines. And so what happened was, through Sun Piumashin's machinations, the three sisters, Supialat, Supiagi, and Supialai, would all be, at one point, married to their half-brother Thibault. This marriage would prove pivotal in the years to come, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. A lot was happening in Burma at this time. First, the British, who already had India under their jurisdiction, and had controlled Rangoon since 1852, 
were demanding annexation of King Mindon's kingdom, Mandalay. King Mindon tried and failed to gain the independent status of his kingdom, even after sending envoys to Europe. They were allowed an audience with Queen Victoria only when accompanied by the Secretary of State for India, implying they were an Indian vassal state and not a sovereign equal. They also tried to gain recognition from the French and Italian governments, but only gained commercial treaties. Second, King Mindon unexpectedly died in 1878. At the time, he was already boxed in by British hostility and the inability of France and Italy to assist his landlocked kingdom, which was mostly accessible through British Rangoon. In short, Burma was in a bad geographical position and an unfortunate time in history. Third, and here's where things get a little more interesting. King Mindon failed to name an heir. Some ten years earlier, the heir to the throne was killed in an aborted palace coup and he was afraid to name a successor. As I'm sure you would be too in his position, it's basically that sentence. His death intensified court politics as factions prepared for the struggle over succession. Enter Sinpyu Mashin. She was a discarded queen of King Mindon, who was allied by the minister of the Lutdao, or the primary ministerial council in Burma. Together, they persuaded the ministers to choose the minor prince, Ibo, by letting them think he was the easy choice, because he was weak and they could control him. In doing so, Simpyo Mashin would be able to position her daughter, Supialat, to become queen. At the time, only Supialat was married to Thibo. Once Thibo was crowned king, Simpyo Mashin pushed for her eldest daughter, Supiagi, to also be married to him. As customary, she would have precedence over her younger sister, Supialat. But in his stunning defiance of customs, Supialat, at 19 years old, pushed to be crowned queen at the same time as Supiagi. After their wedding, Supialat stayed in Thibault's quarters. This sent another shock through the royal court, as queens traditionally stayed in their own pavilions. Indeed, Supiagi stayed with her mother, and Supialat shared the pavilion with Thibault's sister, Mektila Supaya. Queen Supialat did everything in her power to prevent him from taking on new wives and concubines, which was the first and last time monogamy was observed for a Burmese monarch. When Myoza of Yanang urged Thibault to take a 17-year-old named Yi Kin Yi as his minor wife, Sopialat had them both executed. She did the same to any maid of honor that happened to catch Thibault's eye. She also believed that her son's nurse had poisoned him, so she had her killed too. If she liked you, said a Mandalay abbot, she loved you. If she hated you, she killed you. Nobody was really spared. She eventually displaced her older sister, Supiagi, through a series of intrigues. But fast forward a year into their reign as king and queen, and all was not well in the house of Thibo. Rumors of rival princes plotting to overthrow him reached the ears of his mother-in-law, Simpyu Mashin, and his queen, Supialat. The matter would be dealt with swiftly, one night in 1879. Charles Turwazel and Guide to the Mandalay Palace, published in 1963, would give an account of the brutal act. The princes were bludgeoned to death by blows on the back of their neck, and queens and princesses by blows on their throats. Rumor has it that while these executions were being effected, Traditional dramas were played on stage to drown out the screams. <laughs> Supianat's maid of honor later told writer Harold Fielding that all of King Mindon's sons who could be found were executed. Only two, the Nyangwok and Yongyan princes, escaped. Allegedly, the British residents saved their lives and took them to Lower Burma. Many writers, such as Uthan Sui and Suda Shah, maintain that it was in fact Sin Piu Ma Shin who was responsible for the massacre. So Pialat in all likelihood knew about the plan, but was not instrumental in carrying it out. Many people still attribute it to her, though. I guess that's a mystery we'll never truly get to the bottom of. Nevertheless, so Pialat rose to the occasion, and by 1882, she assumed full control of the government of Upper Burma. You've heard of the terms colonization or decolonization in bits and pieces. 
But do you find European colonization too broad and too complicated to get into? Well, there is now a podcast for you. Join me, Fidelity, on an introduction through the history of colonization. We will cover not just the major wars and conquests that took place, but also the perspectives of people who have been neglected in the grand Eurocentric narrative of discovery in colonial lands. You can find the History of Colonization podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast from. Her petticoat was yellow, and her little cap was green, and her name was Sophia, just the same as the boss queen. And I seed her first a smoking of a whacking white cheroot, said Rudyard Kipling in his Bow Mandalay. Like many Burmese women, Supialat was a smoker of cheroots, a cigar with both ends open and untapered. Kipling's mention of her is not the only one in popular culture. She is also featured in novels like F. Tennyson Jesse's The Lacquer Lady, published in 1929, and The Glass Palace by Amitav Ghosh, published in 2000. Where King Theobald was described as fearful and vacuous, Supialat was called domineering, vindictive, vain, and imperious. One wonders, of course, if it had anything to do with the fact that she was a queen and not a king. Would they have said the same things if she were? Or would her actions have simply been par for the course? According to one of Supialat's maids of honor, no one could stand against her when she was angry. It were better to face a tigress. Everyone bent and shivered before her, and whatever order she gave were carried out. The king was but a foolish schoolboy before her. The 19-year-old queen installed trusted ministers and controlled political outcomes. She did not only act the part, she looked the part too. According to Terence R. Blackburn in The British Humiliation of Burma, Supialat wore a huge diamond necklace some three or four rows deep, while a sort of coronet set with rubies, emeralds, and diamonds was fixed in the folds of her hair just above her forehead. She was observed to be wearing English shoes, unusual for someone who supposedly detested anything Western. Following the massacre of 1879, the British government in Rangoon expressed righteous indignation. They also saw an opportunity to increase pressure on Mandalay. According to David Joel Steinberg's seminal text In Search of Southeast Asia, which was the main source for this episode, King Thibault's government sent an envoy to the British Governor-General in Calcutta to appeal for the resumption of friendly relations. He was completely ignored. His envoys then claimed for Burma the right as a sovereign state to send ambassadors to the Queen in London, but that too was denied. They then tried to ask for a treaty to be drawn up in the name of the two sovereigns. The British only offered a royal treaty of friendship and a separate commercial treaty with the Indian government. Burma, utterly humiliated by this denial of equality, withdrew its envoys. In 1883, like King Mindan before him, King Thibault's government tried to find a counterbalancing alliance by dispatching envoys to France. Anglo-French tension heightened, especially because at this time, France was already occupying northern and central Vietnam. But the French refused to back Burma. Premier Jules Ferry only conceded a letter promising armed shipment over land from Tonkin, Vietnam, if judged compatible with French interests. A note on French interests here. It was mostly in teak and rubies. Then, as today, 90% of the world's rubies come from Burma. For a time, Britain did not act on her plans for annexation, as they were occupied elsewhere. But in late 1885, and unfortunately for Mandalay, the troops were idle. The British gave King Thibault an ultimatum that would, among others, install a British resident in Mandalay with a guard and allow direct access to the king without having to remove his shoes. This was a big deal, by the way. At this point, the British have had an issue with removing their shoes for decades. Allegedly, and despite advice to the contrary, Queen Supialat and her allied minister gave an unyielding reply to the British. When the 20-day ultimatum expired in mid-November, British forces took Mandalay. The annexation of Upper Burma was announced on January 1, 1886. It was the end of the Konbaung dynasty and of Burma's independence. They would not regain it until January 4, 1948. In the VNA database, there is a painting depicting this exact moment. The king and queen stand in the center of the picture under umbrellas, with two children in front and courtiers to their right. In the background is the palace, and on each side, its walls. 
The road is lined with British troops, with a British officer mounted on a horse on each side. Two bullock-drawn carriages are on the left, and in front of the royal party, in the foreground, stand British and Sikh officers and two Burmese officials wearing short black jackets and passos of Luntaya Aceh pattern silk. Thibo and Supyalat's carriages were escorted under armed guard to a ship that would take them, thousands of miles away, to a small fishing town in India called Ratnagiri. According to the historian Sudha Shah, it was not a random choice. Ratnagiri then had no roads and could only be reached by boat. During monsoons, it was all but cut off. It was highly practical for the British and very symbolic of what they wanted to do. The dowager, Sinpyu Mashin, and the eldest daughter, Supyagi, were taken to Tavoy, now Dawe, in southeastern Myanmar. There's no indication where the youngest, Supyale, was taken. Divided and out of sight, the British set out to erase the memory of the Konbaung dynasty, which had ruled Burma for the past 133 years. What followed the royal family's forced exit to India was the bloody pacification of Burma. British troops burned down villages and carried out mass executions of people they declared rebels. It would take the British eight years to establish control over the whole of Burma, a Burma whose borders will forever be redefined by colonial rule. While in exile, Supyalat wrote long letters to the Viceroy in Calcutta, pleading for a larger allowance, the return of her stolen jewels, and to be allowed to return home. One of these jewels was a massive ruby called the Naumok, allegedly stolen by British officer Edward Bosk Sladen. Many people believe that it was used by the British in their crown jewels, but this has never been proven. Ibo's last great-grandson, Wu So Win, is still searching for the Naumok ruby to this day. Like many of the artifacts taken by the British, the former King Thibault would never see his motherland again. He died in 1916 in Ratnagiri, India. His remains have not yet been repatriated. Supyalat never gave up trying to return to Burma. Three years after Thibault's death, she and two of her daughters were finally allowed to return to Rangoon. The former royal family still held sway over many of their former subjects and the public in general. Their residence at 23 Common Cochin Road saw many Burmese and European visitors. She insisted they address her in the royal custom, and they did, of course. In 1924, she asked a visiting Burmese reporter from the Bandula Journal, Is it true that people believe I killed the princess? When he said yes, she replied, I didn't. I was a child when I was installed on the throne. It was said that in the twilight of her life, she often wore white, the color of remorse. But for what? The manipulations that brought her to the throne, the royal massacre in 1879, the excesses throughout her reign, or the ultimate failure to defend Mandalay against the British. In 1925, a few hours before her 66th birthday, the last Queen of Burma passed away. The British government paid for her royal procession, which was the last in Burmese history. Her body was shielded under eight white royal umbrellas, attended by 90 Buddhist monks, and the British governor, Sir Harcourt Butler, with a guard of honor of the mounted police, complete with a 30-gun salute. Her tomb still stands today in the Kandaumin Garden Mausolea on Shwedagon Pagoda Road, overlooking the pagoda she loved during her lifetime. Producing a podcast like this takes a lot of time and research. If you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon, like Ashley, Shireen, Chanda, Laura, Yati, Kara, and Mando, who have been supporting this podcast. Give as little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, a shout-out at the end of the next episode, the occasional bonus episode, and a scannable Spotify magnet of the podcast through the mail. Again, this episode has been re-recorded for the first anniversary. If you want to hear the Legacy Episode 1, that's still available on the Patreon. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at HerStoryCPod. That's HerStory, S-E-A, Pod. In the next episode, we'll talk about Raja Hijau's rise to power and the Malay Sultanate of Patani's nearly unbroken line of queens, 
from 1584 to 1718. There are so many more stories to tell and we're just getting started. This podcast was written, hosted, and edited by Agas Ramirez. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you again next time. Sampai jumpa lagi!